Today we're talking about Alex Murdaugh. Of course, we've been we've done a couple of videos on him so far. We're sort of going back a little bit, and we're actually looking at the interrogation. And in this thing, you're going to see a lot of things that they're tough to see unless they're pointed out to you. This is the small stuff we're always talking about. Nothing huge, but these are things that will that are almost mind blowing things that you you may not have seen before. So you may learn something. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, so this is a first for us as well, because there's an attorney present here. He doesn't bring up his voice very often, but there is an attorney present during an interrogation, which is powerful because now it changes the way the investigator has to approach him. These videos are the first time he was asked to the police station, and this is a SLED agent talking to him, South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. And this is the first time he's confronted with evidence of that video about him being at the kennels. That's an important part of why he was convicted. We found out from a juror. And then we also find out that the guy he's calling or he was trying to get through to is the guy that that video was sent to, Roro. So it's an important part of this discussion. But I also want you to know there's an attorney there and he's interfering at least once. There's a lot of subtlety in this one and I think you'll enjoy it. Wait till the end. That's the cliffhanger. There is a video on Paul's phone of um, you and him on the farm that night, and you were in khaki pants and a dress shirt. You were playing with a tree. I don't remember playing with a tree. Yeah, I guess there was a tree sapling or something that was had fallen over or bending over, and you were trying to get it to stand back, stand up. Um, but I mean, the, the question in that is. When I met you that night, you were in shorts and a t-shirt. At what point in that evening did you change clothes? I'm not sure. I, you know, it would have been... Before dinner or after dinner? No, it would have been... What time of day was that? I would have thought I had already changed. <laughs> uh, there's not a time. Is he asking you now what time that picture was? Yes, sir. Go ahead. I'm staff on it because there's so many posts, um, but I want to say it's, it looks to be about dusk. So that would have been 7, 30, 8 o'clock. I guess I changed when I got back to the house. Earlier when, earlier when we spoke. <clears throat> All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, really simple this one, but look at the strong difference between Murdo and the interviewer that's more visible there. The difference in how set the body language is. So Murdo really closed down. You're not gonna see him move at all pretty much in this video. And the interviewer, way more movement happening. So just that contrast for me is exciting because I go, let's see if that changes. Let's see if the interviewer can get Murdo to open up his body language or close down even more. Can one affect the other? We're going to actually see that in the next video. So it's pretty quick. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so we'll go back to my analysis of just focusing on what's missing here in a few of these videos, what's missing, omitted, or concealed in every statement that you hear. And here he's skipping over the clothing the detective has very clearly illustrated in this question. And in an interrogation of innocent people, when they don't know something, there's something that you're going to hear from them. They're going to say, I don't know. And they're going to be comfortable with not knowing the information. And when you see guilty people in an interrogation, they're always more willing to negotiate details and nuance because of their need to appear helpful. But innocent people have no problem most of the time talking about remembering these details. So we're going to focus on this. And uh, in the coming videos, we're going to talk, we're going to actually teach you about interrogation and some of the secrets of how that stuff works. Looking forward to that, Scott. All right. From a body language perspective, uh, he's pretty much batting down the hatches. This is for the person who doesn't know much about body language. This is one of those few times when you see crossed arms and it means what you think it means. He's he's just completely locked down. He's got his arms crossed. He's got his legs crossed. Everything's tight. He's not moving much. He's trying to stay in control because he's being put on the spot. He doesn't know what these guys know yet. Doesn't know what the questions are going to be. So he's got to be very careful. Careful. So he's paying attention to that. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, guys, you know, I'm kind of the priest of baselining. It's what matters most to me. What you're going to see is something we taught guys resisting interrogation to never do. And that's create an artificial posture you can't maintain. And what he's doing is coming in all locked down because he thinks he can control his body language. This guy who's questioning him and does a great job of soft pedaling some questions and hard pedaling others so that he feels the pressure at times. Now, if you, there's a couple other things to note here. This is a low pressure interrogation. One of the few you're going to see that's this calm and this contained and very little pressure. What we know is if I put high pressure on you and introduce facts, they can become memories. So he doesn't have that as a defense because nobody forced anything on him. That's not what's going on. He looks terribly frightened. He's doing this because he's fishing. And you watch him, you'll be able to tell when he's looking for information they have. And he's starting off. When he is locked down this whole way where he doesn't move at all, he's looking for a way to contain everything he's doing. But then he adapts and rocks as they ask him about that video. When we say adapting, we mean he's releasing nervous energy. For him, we saw this on the stand, but this is a very different him from on the stand because he is not yet discovered to be the guilty party or claimed. But when they bring up the video and ask him what time, he asked what time of the day was that, he's fishing to see if they have the video that was taken of him. We also know that he said, I was going to do something with Paul's phone at the site wonder what he was going to do with Paul's phone. Maybe he knew this was an incriminating video. And he was trying to get away from it. We can't tell that. What we can tell is he is fishing. He's locked. He almost looks like a photo through the entire thing. And when you see that baseline deviation, you're going to know something has changed. And by that, I, this is why I always say, you are sitting on the couch eating Cheetos baseline is not what we're looking for. We're looking for what you're advertising when you come in the door and how much deviation there occurs. This is a great start. Did you guys hear me swallow earlier? How loud no, that no. was? It was like, no, it's like a glow. The eyewitness is you. There is a video on Paul's phone of um, you and him on the phone that night. And you were in khaki pants and a dress shirt. You were playing with a tree. I don't remember playing with a tree. Yeah. I guess there was a tree sapling or something that was had fallen over or bending over and you were trying to get it to stand back, stand up. Um, but I mean, the, the question in that is, when I met you that night, you were in shorts and a t-shirt. At what point in that evening did you change clothes? I'm not sure. I, you know, it would have been... Before dinner or after dinner? No, it would have been... What time of day was that? I would have thought I'd already changed. Uh, there's not a time. Is he asking you now what time that picture was? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead. I'm staff on it because there's so many posts, um, but I want to say it's, it looks to be about dusk. So that would have been 7, 30, 8 o'clock. I guess I changed when I got back to the house. Earlier when earlier when we spoke. <clears throat> and Maggie was heard in the background. And you were heard in the background. And that was prior to nine. Yeah. I, I heard Rogan Gibson ask me if I was up there. He said he thought it was me. Was it you? Yeah. And, at nine o'clock? Yes, sir. No, sir. Not if my times are right. Who do you think it could have been? I have no idea. And Rogan's been around your family for pretty much all of his life. Oh, absolutely. And he recognizes your voice and you have a distinct voice. anybody else that has a voice somewhere in yours that he may have um, misinterpreted? No, no, sir. I mean, he... You know, when we were talking, he had asked me that, so, you know, I mean, he had told me he thought I was up there. Did that surprise him? Yes, sir. So when you were 
returned back to the kilns when you returned home from your mother's. Um, All right, Greg, what do you got? This is why we tell you not to come in with a wonky baseline because you see he's been locked down. Now watch that thumb. He's got a, I think he has a tissue in that hand if you watch him. He's just wearing the hell out of that tissue. Scott, to your point, he never uses it for tears, but he sure is adapting on it. It's a tissue or something else. Kind of like a kid has a whoopee or something and they play with it all the time and they feel stressed. All of us do something. When he's asked the question about nine o'clock, he distances, gives himself a split second to answer by saying at nine o'clock. Then you see the rocking and his foot pressing on the floor. That's a lot when you came in locked down as tight as he was. That's why you don't do that and why you can't hide something. Chase, you always talk about politeness spikes. There's definitely a deferential sir at no, it's not just no sir, it's no sir at I cannot think of anyone else. There's no protest in this guy at all at being accused of being, and this is accusation by question. We all do it in the interrogation room. Is there any reason you would call it bait questions and in regular intelligence interrogation, we'll call it put on notice by question. There's all kinds of things you may call it. But he is being accused by question, and he's not defiant. He's not indignant. His chin is not out, and there's no eye locked. That makes me go, hmm, why is this guy doing this? Scott, what do you got? All right. So we see he's changed his leg positions, and he's loosened up just a little bit. That's because he's he's eased up. That that first part, I think, is, is obviously at the beginning, so he's really, really tense at this point or up to that point. Now he's sort of relaxed, not relaxed, but he's letting go just a little bit. So he's gone from guarding his stomach and, and keeping that tight down to guarding his genitals, which we saw in the car as well. So I think he's realized uh, from a body language perspective, since the fight is on now and he knows it is, he's got to look and sound like he's being honest. So I think he's in a small way, I think he's taking into consideration what he looks like just a little bit, not much, but just a little bit more. So he's not as uh, as uh, squinched up as he was. As, and like you said, Greg, a lot going on with that thumb and forefinger, man. It looks like he's almost like playing a air banjo and his voice is quiet. And there are no big pops of, of uh, voice volume and his tone doesn't jack up or anything. He's focused. So he's, he's, he's going in fairly steady at this point. And then after the question comes about uh, the time of his whereabouts, his head goes into that that bobble thing where he's saying where his head is yes and no and spinning around. I think if we didn't understand what that was, we'd see that more as confusion because I think he's he's sorting out what he's going to say and being very careful to how he says it, which is important to him because now he's got to remember everything he's saying because as far as we know, something may have changed in the story he prepared to this story now. That's what it looks like because there's a whole lot of thinking going on in there. Taking the stress he's, he's experiencing from the interrogator in consideration, yeah, but it looks like a little bit more than that to me. Um, I'll leave it there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so we're all in agreement that, that he was choosing to do this behavior. I think we're probably right to say he's choosing to do that because he wants to lock it down, he wants to be in control. And this is now 10 minutes later and he's changed. And I think that is a result of the interview that's going on and the interviewer. The interviewer has managed to get some element of change out of him. I reckon I could do this all day if I really, really wanted to, unless there's something else occupying my mind that I then forget to do this and start to do behaviors which are more unconscious to me. And so to your point, Scott, I think this protection of the primary sexual characteristics, which we're now seeing, is more unconscious behavior of him. So if the interviewer has done anything here, yes, it's caused him to have to think about other elements that are going on, most likely the story story that he's telling and so we're getting more unconscious rather than conscious behavior out of him so another con uh, unconscious behavior we're seeing is that thumb move which yes is partly adaption on the uh on the on the tissue or handkerchief that's there, but also we're seeing it as a baton gesture as well, a gesture that moves along to the rhythm of his speech. Although it doesn't, it doesn't quite move along exactly to the rhythm of, of his speech. The baton gesture, the baton, the conducting is incongruent with the rhythm. So I'm gonna suggest, you know, go back, take a look at how incongruent the rhythm of that thumb is, have a listen to what he's talking about, and then think to yourself, 
Is it incongruent because there's extra stress and pressure around this particular element that he's talking about? Is what he's talking about right now, is this going to end up being absolutely consequential to the case? Is it important data? Is he unconsciously signalling how important this element of the story that he's most likely creating is? But look at that really subtle changes ultimately that we can start to think about and think what is the consequence of this further down the line chase what do you got on this one yeah you guys covered a lot i'll just cover one more thing here when he says no sir not if my times are right i want you to just pay attention to that the qualifier here is one of the biggest red flags you can possibly get as an interrogator and i'll tell you why here there is a known piece of information that any reasonable human being could answer from memory. Were you down there? Were you present during this video? So when he makes the denial, it's about time instead of memory. And this is where an interrogator would be asking something like, are you certain that your times are even correct or right? And then the temptation for most people to jump onto this deception is almost irresistible. And instead, I think it's best to accumulate these mistakes and red flags over a period of time, especially with people like this. If you read the average interrogation training, it's going to tell you that undetected lying is rewarding. But in cases like this, where there's lots of rehearsal and stuff, you want to get a mountain of this kind of stuff. So in interrogations like this, especially when you're interrogating an attorney, confessions are extremely unlikely so your job here as the interrogator instead is to develop these red flags and the moment you call someone out on one of those a wall starts building so you don't do that you keep pouring water on these little red flag seeds so they become bigger red flags that the jury can watch during the replay that's all i got same thing's true in intelligence exactly the eyewitness is you And Maggie was her in the background. And you were her in the background. And that was prior to none. Yeah. I, I Rogan Gibson asked me if I was up there. He said he thought it was me. Was it you? At at nine o'clock? Yes, sir. No, sir. Not if my times are right. Who do you think it could have been? I have no idea. And Rogan's been around your family for pretty much all of his life. Oh, absolutely. And he recognizes your voice, and you have a distinct voice. Do you think of anybody else that has a voice somewhere in yours that he may have um, misinterpreted? Mm, no. No, sir. I mean, he... You know, when we were talking, he had asked me that, so... I mean, he had told me that he thought I was up there. Did that surprise you? Yes, sir. When you return back to the kennels, when you return home from your mom's, um, at one point in the 911 call, um, you say here, like you're talking to somebody else or something else. I say here? Here, yes, sir. Dispatcher is asking you um, if they're breathing, and you said no. And she asked if you did you see anyone else in the area, and you said no. And she asked about guns near them, and you said no. And then you kind of stutter and start moving around, and you say here. I don't have any memory of 
saying that. I guess I'd have to listen to it to, uh, you know, but I don't recall a dog being out. I'm certain that there was not a dog out. Um, you know, I mean, there's other things people have told me about that 911 call that I don't remember. Um, I, I don't know here. Like I was calling a dog. Calling a dog, talking to somebody else. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Yes, sir. And, and, and obviously, there was nobody else out there. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'm certain that there was not a dog loose. remember saying anything about Buster would know um, something about threats. Mm -hmm. um, I was asked about that later. If I had information about, or that Buster had information about threats that I said he would know. Um, Chase, what do you got? So right here, I think the detective makes a mistake in searching for the papers about the word here, H-E-R-E. -E. So in interrogations, it's it's really tempting to want to do this, like, oh, I have the evidence right here. But there's no need to illustrate that it's on paper somewhere. But you can see that Murdoch takes advantage of this to buy time. So he's trying to find that when the question is clear, concise, and perfect, he should not have to requalify himself. I think that takes away from his authority or his perceived authority in the interrogation room. And I think second, you're seeing another brilliant and giant red flag here. And this is what I call diving for details. And whether a dog is out or not of a cage or a, a kennel is beyond irrelevant. But Murdoch makes an effort to very carefully examine his memory to determine if a dog was out or not. So when you see this level of detail about relevant details, those are probably green flags. They're indicators you're talking to someone who's probably innocent or being honest. When you see the denial or the, sorry, you see this detail diving into nuance, minutia, irrelevant, hollow details like this, you're seeing something that should scare you pretty bad as an interrogator. So if we stick with the what's missing technique, we're seeing loads of detail about stuff, but the detail is missing around the victims, the timelines, the clothing. Everything relevant to the case has no detail and everything irrelevant and meaningless. He spends tons of time talking about and detailing the little answers around those. Scott, what do you got? All right, on the playback, let's pay really close attention. Mark brought it up earlier of that detective's body language compared to Murdoch's body language. The, the detective's is really fluid. It's big. He's using big illustrators and, and talking fairly slow, and his tone stays even. Everything's good. And then Murdoch, whose brain is on fire with uh, trying to keep up with everything that's happening, Watch, watch him. Like Greg said earlier, he's it's almost like a, a picture or a mannequin. He's just sitting there. Nothing moves much at all. We still see a little bit of the, the thumb happening, but he's running scenarios in his head. And what if it goes this way? What if it goes that way? What if it goes this way? Then the, I, I thought the I saw the, the plays looking for the, for the, uh, the papers chase. I saw that more as, as it just trying to take up time between questions to help build that tension. That's where I went, but I see what you're saying. That makes sense. But I, I think in there, we saw a great example after he finished asking the question, how he would sit there and look at him, where he would pretend like he was doing something else and just let Murdoch talk and talk. Then he'd stop and he'd add more stuff and he'd stop and add more. And that's a technique you use. And you can use it at home on your kids. And you ask, where have you been? And they tell you, did you go to so-and-so's place? And you, they say, yeah, I went to her house or his house. And you just keep doing this. Don't look like this, but look normal. And see what else they give you. See if they'll keep talking. See if they'll give you a little bit more information. They may, they may not. They may They may say, why are you acting so weird? Most likely they won't do that because they're going to be thinking, whoops, they don't believe me. Whoops, they don't believe me. Which goes back to 
the the when you when someone's talking to you and they break eye contact, most people are in the impression that person's lying to you. Whereas we know now that the person who doesn't break eye contact with you, the huge percentage of that says that they are lying to you because their brain wants to keep an eye on you to make sure you believe them. And if they if you don't believe them, they'll start adding qualifiers. And this is a version of that. But it's it's a more advanced version of that, what the detective is doing. He's not looking for qualifiers. He's just looking for this guy to spill more information. That's how it looks to me. Greg, what do you think? What do you got? Yeah, so a couple of things. Chase, while I agree with you, that is from the mechanical side and the pure fact, the, an important part of how you go after that information. You also have to remember, I trained a lot of interrogators in my life, and it's all about this is an art form, and it has to fit the person. So that guy probably has got enough under his belt. He feels comfortable doing it a certain way. And I've had interrogators who had the, I called it the bungling Columbo method that would rifle through things and just clean house. Others who can't do that. And so I think it depends on the person. And I would say, that all of this stuff, and we're all on the same page, all this stuff is an art form. Every one of us has our own art and style in the way we do it. It also is theater for one. So you have to be believable to that guy. If you know that guy, if you've had exposure to him, you may have a different approach. So, it, I, you know, I want to know what the guy's thinking when he's doing this. I'd love to talk to you if you're there and you're listening to us. We'd love to talk to you about what you're thinking while you're interrogating Murdoch. Another couple of interesting things um, for me that when he's doing that dog thing, to me, that's a chaff and redirect. He's looking for every opportunity he can because this guy, and if you don't know what chaff and redirect is with us, it's when I spew useless information for you to pick up and follow. And we get people in the comments always saying this stuff doesn't work. Well, if you're talking about absolutes and you touch your nose, yeah, it doesn't work. We interrogate for a living. So it's one of many skill sets, all the body language we're talking about. The behavior is another layer. The questioning, all the theater stuff that he's doing, all those are layers of this approach. And what we prey on, this guy's been sitting in a vacuum, deconflicting his story since he killed these people. He has no idea what they know, and now he's starting to find out, and they're poking. He's got to deconflict on the fly. And Chase, Scott and Chase, you both brought it up. He's starting to feel a little stressed because now he knows something he didn't know when he came in. When they question him about this 911 call, I call this extra edit info because when a person is writing, an e if you have been around long enough that you used email all the time, you would edit your email, and you'd have junk at the end. You would delete that. A lot of times when people are deconflicting their story before they go on 911, they're going to have words flowing through their head. They've practiced and practiced and practiced. And then that last word that dropped out there might make no sense whatsoever. None. And so anytime I hear that, I go, that's a push pull word for me. Something I want to grab and pull. Last, I'll say, and there's a bunch in here, but the last one I'll point out, there's a poor camera angle. But I think he does a regulator. And we talk about a regulator being a way to control conversation. Look at his head, fish for information as to whether the guy believes him or not. Pay really close attention. See if you agree with me. If you don't, if you think it's just a, some anomaly, put that in the notes too. If you think all this doesn't work, it, don't ever go into an interrogation without a lawyer because it does work. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, what I love about this is, is both of the major players here are good enough, more than good enough, or experienced enough that we're able to look at the real subtleties that are going on here and kind of go, well, I wonder if the tactic here is this or it's this. I'm going to split the difference on the tactic here, and it's to do with the rhythm. I think the initial element there of looking for that piece of data is, is real. Because, because I think he's actually searching for the piece of data and, and he doesn't quite know where it is. And I, and I picked that up from how fast that and indirect that rhythm is. Then he slows it down because I think he goes, you know what, as I'm looking for this, I may as well play it. Now, my bias would be I would play it even bigger and even longer, but, you know, that's my exhibitionism there. You know, how much can I turn up the heat even more by making this last a lot, lot longer on this? But, you know, everybody's got their own idea, their own style. They're, they're going to do what they're going to do in this situation, regardless of what the reality is. I think this interrogation, this questioning has him now locked in a new position. He's now locked in this new, what was an unconscious position. Uh, maybe he's locked unconsciously. Maybe he's locked himself now consciously and gone, okay, stay with this, stay covered up in this area. Because once again, he's, he's locked down and he's using, I don't know, I don't remember, and he's not moving and he's not responding in any big way. So isn't that wonderful? Started off locked down. Interrogator managed to 
open him up really by getting him to change position, get him on the back foot a little bit. And now he's locked himself down uh, again. So where's this going to go next? I'm interested to find out. There, that's all I got on that one. The eyewitness is you. At one point in the 911 call, um, you say here, like you're talking to somebody else or something else. I say here? Here. Yes, sir. So the dispatcher is asking you um, if they're breathing, and you said no. And she asked if you, did you see anyone else in the area, and you said no. She asked about guns near them, and you said no. And then you kind of stutter and start moving around, and you say here. saying that I guess I have to listen to it to, uh, you know but I don't recall a dog being out I'm certain that there was not a dog out um, you know I mean there's other things people have told me about that 911 call that I don't remember um, I, I don't know here. Like I was calling a dog. Calling a dog, talking to somebody else. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Yes, sir. And I mean, that obviously was nobody else out there. Okay. And I'm, I'm certain that there was not a dog loose. saying anything about Buster would know um, some about threats. Um, I was asked about that later if I had information about or that Buster had information about threats that I said he would know. Um, Shotgun and a pump shotgun. 
the Benelli and the Browning, are they pump or autos? The Benelli and the Browning are automatic. And the pump shotgun, what brand is that? I believe it's a Remington, but I'm not positive. Are they, all, are they like standard brown and black, all black or camo? Um, the uh, Benelli is, is black, the Browning is camo, and the pump is camo. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so let's start off, Chase, back to your point about what his style is, because he has a very specific style, and what he's doing is he's walking it very slowly and going at him. If you want to know, here's the one that I think he could have just torn him a new one right here, but he didn't. He chooses to hold off. The guy says, "I when that night when I picked up ammunition to load the shotgun, I don't have any idea what I picked up. Well, it, do you find it a random coincidence that this guy had an empty shotgun in his house? The rest of them weren't, clearly but he went and got exactly the same ammo and loaded it that these people were killed with. Hold on. Now you could, that could right there be enough of a rift. If there's not an attorney there for us to have our feet squarely under us and go at him hard and interrogation often to Chase's point, will go, they'll wait until they get this big blunder. They'll let one pass. They'll get this big blunder and then they'll tear the scab off. In his case, he doesn't, he's a little bit more meticulous, which makes me think his style and we'd love to talk to you again. I forget his, I think it's Davis is his last name. But if you know and I'm wrong and you know this guy, please ask him to come talk to us. We'd love to talk to him. Listen to his style. Now, I, Mark, you started off by talking about the difference in the two of them. Everybody in the room's moving along normally, scratching, milling. He's locked down tight again. Now he's back to his you know, resistance to interrogation idea it, that's not how it really works by any any means guys the two of us who are resistance trained would tell you there's no way i would ever go in lockdown it's a dumb way to move this i love the way the agent goes in with a slow delivery at the reason i am asking is and he's moving look when you get a guy close to confession you always slow that language down because you bring them down a notch you lower your voice and it brings them down and he does something masterful here masterful whether he did it intentionally or not i love it he asked a question that is non-pertinent and non-pertinent questions are the most lethal questions in interrogation the reason is because the guy has no reason to lie so what is he going to do he's going to do what's normal and he does he raises that hand to illustrate now we know how he normally responds to an easy question he's happy to answer that because he feels like he's being helpful which is what most bad guys do but his feet and thumb are moving, and he here he goes again. That night when he's talking about grabbing shells. You could say this is a missed opportunity. I think it's a great opportunity for him to go at the guy. Then he squeezes that arm as he slowly answers the description of the shotgun. Why not? It was a camouflage shotgun. 12-gauge, Remington. Hmm, because something's up. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so one thing in interrogations, and we're going to talk about some of the good, some of the bad here, and any of the criticisms that we offer about the interrogation or the techniques are not on the officer. Uh, the training is lacking in a lot of departments. So we're not making any judgments about the officer there uh, in particular. But one Great thing job. that's that's true about interrogations, the more people that are in the room, the less likely you are to get a confession, period. And that's proven time and time again. But when he's talking about the missing guns, there's a complete loss of fluency where he's having trouble putting sentences together. There's hedging and qualifying, um, saying it between it's missing or I believe was missing. And then he says our guns, the big emphasis on our guns. Wondering what that means. It, the emphasis is extremely unusual. And his characteristic nodding as a hint, if you see this, he is lying. So that is his personal tell. Uh, like I showed you, or all of us showed you in the squad car video before the trial even started so that you could look for it in the trial uh, as the footage came out. And I think finally in this clip, he is locked on. So when he's asked these detailed questions, he doesn't look away. When you ask a normal person, <laughs> to recall some details, their eyes will move to recall what gun it was, what it looked like, and their head sometimes will move with their eyes. So they'll they'll do this normally. And this is this head and eye lock is indicative of deception, especially when it's piled up with this giant cluster of all these other indicators, which Greg, you've covered so many of. And 
Liars are more likely to do this when they lie because they're subconsciously trying to look more factual and believable. So honest people need to move their eyes and head to recall details. And one more thing he does here, and you'll hear this in his voice, he transitions into what sounds like a fifth grader reading a paper in front of a class. And this is two-factored. One, he's unknowingly doing this to sound more clear and believable, but he's not doing it consciously. His brain's doing this behind the scenes. Two, he's doing this because he's trying to look honest by speaking in a slowed pace. And in my interrogation courses, we call this a shift to clinical language. It's actually the sister, or very closely related to uh, another thing we talk about called pronoun absence, or when the pronouns disappear from a person's language or answers. Mark? Yeah, so now I believe we have some self-soothing on the elbow here. Now, why is that important? Because, you know, why might, might it be more important than, say, some self-soothing on the arm or on the forearm? Was I say, you know, as much as I possibly can, this is a vulnerable area on the body. The knuckles are vulnerable. The wrist is vulnerable. This uh, elbow area is vulnerable. If those areas get damaged, you lose the use of way more of your of your arm. If this gets damaged here, well, you still got your shoulder, you still got the elbow, you still got the wrist. So, you know, the more Mark, vulnerable a joint is, yeah, Chase. When you you came down to Virginia, you and I were having a glass of wine and you taught me about this and you were telling me about it and I was internally processing going, well, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. And while I was like trying to see, oh, is that true or not? You grabbed my elbow and I had a visceral response to it and it yeah. was so different. So it is a, I have told this to so many people since you taught me this. So, sorry, I just wanted to put no, that in there. Right. It's so true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I you thought really you. I thought you were getting the, the shits and giggles, and I was getting ready to go, man. That's when you had that smile on your face. I thought, <laughs> what about this? Must be good. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. If you really want to annoy somebody, grab their elbow, take control of their elbow, take take control of their wrist. Just take their finger and just take a joint of it and mess around with the joint. It'll super, super annoy them. So look, that's why this is of interest more than this or this, because it's way more protectionist, I would say. Now, here's one last thing that's interesting me. We've got this kind of almost rocking back and forth, but certainly the head moving back and forth. Now, what is that about? Here's what I'm gonna tell you. I don't know for sure what that's about, but I'm gonna give you all the options I can come up with very quickly in my mind, and it won't be all the options out there. And what you need to do as somebody who's interested in nonverbal communication and looking at situations and going, what is the truth of this? Is you've got to go, well, what if it's this? Or what if it's that? Or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that, and get those clusters together. Could be compliance, could be a, a yes. And he's just, not, he's not saying yes to everything. He's just trying to show compliance. It could be self-soothing could be soothing himself. It could be a barrier gesture. It could be him trying to, you know, take away everything out there and just moving his body in order that no other information can come in, almost a kind of a trance-like state. In fact, Greg, um, uh, Scott, you probably, I think that's probably what you call the trancer state. Because look, uh, if you go, um, if you go and see dervishes, for example, or you go to the Wailing Wall, go to the Wailing Wall and see the movement in front of the Wailing Wall, it's a trance state movement. So you literally can, can change the way your mind is functioning by simply moving your head up and down. It's like twirling round and round and round and round and round will change the state of your mind. The whirling dervishes do that. Try it out, try it out, but um, but make sure that all the furniture is moved apart because you'll probably fall over. Greg, what's your thought? Mark, one last thing to add to that. This guy had a serious opiate addiction and neural pathways, 10,000 strikes, they get to be a habit. Who knows Absolutely. how many times he rocked as Absolutely. he was off that. So for sure, I've got, I've got down here, drug use. It can yep, come yep. with drug use. I used to work, work with uh, a lot of heroin addicts myself, and you would see it. You would see it a lot, depending on, on what state they were in. Had they used recently? Had they not used recently enough? Um, it could be stimming. So it could be neurodivergent or diverse or neuroatypical or a whole bunch of other things. Do I know which one it is? Well, I can make my guess and then I can test my guess as we go along. But the important thing is, is it's 
a guess. You're making your best guess now on all the information you have to be intelligent and then you're testing that guess to get closer to the truth and you might well get there but you don't do it with this always equals that it's all possibility it's all a state of of maybe and you might go well mark that just means you you know nothing you have no absolutes and it's not having the absolutes that makes you way more intelligent and gets you to the truth quicker i would say uh who we got left on this uh scott yeah all uh, right okay i've left with nothing so i i'll, I'll go with the, an overview he's still locked down that i think the constant bobbing back and forth obviously that's indicative of stress and i think he's tr he's trying to agree with everything at the same time while he's trying to stay locked down at the same time he's blown off that built up stress and tension so i think that's several things at the same time mark i agree with you yeah and he's getting these little bits and pieces of of information from the detective because he's he's slowed down. He's talking slow. He's not giving him very much. It looks like he's getting ready to paint this big picture of here's what's going on, but he doesn't give him much at all. And that's driving him nuts because he's usually the guy in charge. He's the guy that tells you what to do. He's the boss of everything apparently so far. So this is driving him bonkers as he's trying to get through this. Um, and that's why he's locked down so hard as well, because he, he I'm sure he wants to scream because this guy's not giving him information quick enough. And, and then again, and the only movement outside that again is that thumb. And obviously we, we talked about being an adapter because of the timing he's using and all that. All right. So I'll leave it there since most everything's gone already. The eyewitness is you. reason I'm asking about that, <clears throat> the shot shells that we recovered that night, one was a turkey load, one was a buckshot. I understood that. The shotgun that you had with you that night, there was a bird shot and a buckshot. Um, when Jeff went back the next day, um, I'm not sure which attorney it was, pointed out that there had been a shotgun laying on the pool table that he had put away and pointed out that ammunition that was with that, and it was a buckshot and a bird shot. And then the shotgun that we took um, for potential comparison, it was also loaded with a bird shot and a buckshot. So I have all of these consistent loads along with what's that in the feed room. I call it the feed room. And the kennels, is that what you call it? That's, that's okay. fucking good enough. Okay. I just want you, if I say feed room, I just want you to know what I'm talking about. The night I grabbed the shells that I could get my hands on, I, 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 I don't, you know, I had no idea exactly what I had. Okay. Also, when we talked, um, I asked you if it was normal to keep guns down in the, at the kennels. And you said you would have to check. Have you been able to check to see what was missing from your collection? I, I have. It, yes, I, I know what's missing from, what I believe is missing from, from our guns. Okay, and what are those? There's, there's uh, three guns that I think are missing. Okay. And what kind of guns are those? It would be a Benelli shotgun, a Browning shotgun, and a pump shotgun. The Benelli and the Browning, are they pump or autos? The Benelli and the Browning are automatic. And the pump shotgun, what brand is that? I believe it's a Remington, but I'm not positive. Are they all, are they like standard brown and black, all black or camo? Um, the, uh, the belly is, is black, the browning is camo, and the pump is camo. Okay. And, and that's, you know, we, we, we've talked about the shot shells. So the cartridge casings were 300 blackout cartridge casings that were found by Mac. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room. 
and at the shoot, shooting range. We're now asking about shell casings that were found by Maggie. That's Maggie's body, correct? The, show, the, the cartridge case was found by Megan, yes. Had he ever been confronted with this information prior to right now that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. okay cool. I believe he was, but um, not by me, I don't think. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room, and at the shoot, shooting range. Okay in the ones by the house and some of the ones found at the shoot range are confirmed matches to the ones found by maggie okay so which gives another concern i've got the same load as the shot shells in multiple guns and 300 blackout that match the ones found on your property so you now believe that those guns, that Paul's guns were used? Yes. Okay. And missing. And I understand that somebody had seen that gun recently, but, you know, and I'd ask Buster about it. Um, I, I believe that that gun has been gone since back before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, no one do. no one recalls Paul's first 300 going missing around Halloween at a party at Hampton. Halloween of 2020? When, when did y'all? No, that because that no, was no, 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 it, it was years. Yeah, it, was, it, it was whatever. Huh, Chase, what do you got? I like the level of composure here in the interrogator. So it's not this confrontational thing. I have done training in police departments. I will not say which ones, but I've done training in police departments where they just, they didn't have any training. So they just did what they saw on TV. And I'm not joking. That's, they don't have training for the department. So they just copy this aggressive behavior. But let's talk about what's missing here. What's missing is a any denial, even remotely mentioning that, these guns were involved in the crime, and I'm talking about Murdaugh here, a single mention of the guns that were used in the crime or an acknowledgement that it looks bad or the biggest one of all, some kind or some hint of confidence. So his, his body is in full blocking. He's turtling, protecting the brachial arteries under the arm, protecting the groin and femoral arteries. There's abdominal protection there. And if there's one thing, if you go on YouTube and type in a compilation of people getting the crap scared out of them, like somebody pops out of a trash can and all that, you'll see the same reaction in every person. All the arteries start getting protected. The shoulders come up. And we're just kind of seeing that here in permanent form. And just for me, lastly, at the end of his statements, you'll hear a vocal noise that's not language at all. Just kind of a uh coming out of his mouth. And this is maybe a vocal exhaust. It's letting off stress, but secondary to this, it, I think it's a desire to build some confidence, to reassure himself that he is in charge or that he can speak up when he wants to. Don't have a lot of time to get into that. But too many people in the room, the less likely you are to get a confession. Pens and paper, having a pen and paper open and on the table, taking notes while a person is talking, reduces the likelihood of confession. Having a gun on your belt or having multiple people in the room with guns make confessions less likely. The arresting or involved officer conducting the interview makes it exponentially less likely for confession. Uh, but they did do well by not having on a uniform because the uniform also reduces likelihood of confession. So, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, two things. Number one indicator that he's not going to confess, though, to me, Chase, is he's got an attorney sitting there who'd say, shut up. You're done <laughs> yeah. with that, right? Yeah. That's exactly. But you're right. Look, I, I, Dr. Phil says it best. Nobody confesses in a crowd, and he's dead on. It's That's an it, intimate thing when you're talking to somebody. Let me tell you two things that in my all my years of interrogating, I, never, I, I realize the person who is guilty is capable of acting like they're innocent, but people who are innocent have a hard time acting like they're guilty. And by that, I mean, if I'm innocent and you accuse me of something, I'll come up in my chair and come at you. I may say something at least, but I'm going to be indignant. Often, the guy who isn't 
is the most helpful little bastard you're ever going to meet in your life. And he's going to go to front of the mouth talking. Y'all always hear me say that. And this guy does it. He goes, okay. And he does fading facts and does that kind of front of the mouth talk. And you hear it and all the time when people are trying to be uh, solicitous and try to get information out of you. I'll leave that part there. And I'm just going to run down a list of things I see here and let you decide what it means to you. His respiration is up. Watch his chest. His free hand is adapting, meaning this hand that's off to the side is adapting. The hand that's here is squeezing the hell out of the arm. He's doing his Ozzy Osbourne move, as we talked about before. <laughs> he starts to chaff and redirect, and when he does, you see his feet dance and his cadence slow, and then he hits a bunch of ums. We say no single indicator of deception, but a damn pile of deception like that, seeing a whole lot of indicators, means something to me. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, well, actually, that front of the mouth talking, Greg. I'm worried that you're trying to steal my Penelope pit stop impression. There, it's getting, hail, it's getting awfully close. <laughs> getting awfully close. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit worried and a, and a little bit <laughs> nervous about about my property uh, on that one. Uh, now, look, um, uh, what I really love about this because I agree with you, Chase, that that the interviewer here um, is is doing a really subtle, calm interview compared to, a, you know, the classic TV idea of an interrogation. It's, it's nothing like you'd expect if you've seen all those TV interviews. And at the same time, he has got bigger with his gestures. So that points to me, Scott, to what you were saying. I think he's getting a little impatient and maybe a little excited about this. I think he can see somebody who's locked themselves down and is giving a few indicators of the stress that he's under. And he's seeing the, the impression that his questions have. And so there's gonna be an edge of excitement there that I think we're seeing in the gestures. And at the same time, all of us want things to move along a lot quicker. Like all of us want a result. And I think even though he's got to know that he's there with a lawyer and he's not going to get any confession and there's other people in there and, and you know, it's it's unlikely, he's got, you know, you'd want it all the same, wouldn't you? You'd want that moment. And I think that's what we're seeing in those big gestures is a level of wanting to move this along and the excitement of it. So, so uh, you know, impatience and excitement I see there in the interview. Now, the subject here, we see some foot stamps. We see it because we see the, the, the knee move and, and very directly down, down, down. I want you to go back and have a listen to what he was talking about when, when he's doing those suppressive gestures with his foot. And then think at, around the case and think, was that information, was what's being talked about around there, did it become pertinent to the case? Did it, was it, was it information that anybody who has perpetrated a crime would want suppressed but they're not able to say shut up be quiet don't talk about that I'm, i don't want to answer questions on that i don't want that information but unconsciously he's stamping down on that i think i think that might be the case uh who have we got left scott me yeah you guys dang covered everything but i agree with you chase i i when you when you go train and then you run into somebody let's say you go to a different town and then you get pulled over and they a police officer says, where do I know you yeah. from? And you say, well, I do this, this, and oh, wait, no, you trained you trained us in interrogation. And then you say, well, how's everybody doing? And they always have that one guy that didn't listen. <laughs> you know, he only went through things <laughs> one time, you know, or he's using his read technique the wrong way. And they'll say, this was, you know, and those guys get on my nerves, the ones that don't pay attention and really mess things up for somebody. That, so I, I know where you're coming from. That that really gets on my last nerve. I won't get I get worked up if I get into that. And before we get finished with this, let me just add this in here. And this is about Greg. Greg, would you mind doing that frontal mouth voice and just say the ABCs in it? Yes, please. Sure. Yeah, later. <laughs> let's, hear it. Let's, let's hear it now. Let's go ahead and do it now. I don't know if I can. A, B, let's hear it. Let's C, take a shot. D, E, F, G. There you go. That's good enough. <laughs> can, let's, see, let's hear it, man. Do the alphabet. I'm done. I did it. <laughs> oh, dude. I know where you live. Oh, Remember, you got two times. I know still. that would have been so good. <laughs> anyway, but now he's got that Kleenex out, and and he's goofing around with that the whole time. And it's and his his adapting thing is really really working up a little bit here. And I'm sure he's been using it to wipe his fake tears and his, you know, his r fake runny nose and all that stuff, like we saw in that initial car video. As you do, I think Mark is the one that brought that up. Um, and then there, there's such little head movement that, again, he looks almost like a mannequin. And it's very odd 
to see something like that out in the wild or see something normal. So you automatically, like Greg always goes back to you, this is just, it's weird because he's just frozen and talking. You don't see that very often from someone who is a, uh, is a normal as far as um, the brain goes. You don't see that very often. Um, but he, but he looks almost like a mannequin. And so that's, I think you guys have covered everything. I'm going for it here. I'm trying to find something to go over, but I got nothing. <laughs> so I can do it, but it'd be boring as hell. The eyewitness is you. And, and that's, you know, we, we've talked about the shot shells. So the cartridge casings were 300 blackout cartridge casings that were found by Mac. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room. And at the shoot, shooting range. We're now asking about shell casings that were found by Maggie. That's Maggie's body, correct? The, show, the, the cartridge case was found by Megan, yes. Had he ever been confronted with this information prior to right now that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Okay. Cool. I believe he was, but um, not by me, I don't think. Okay. Megan. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room, and at the shoot, shooting range. Okay. And the ones by the house and some of the ones found at the shoot range are confirmed matches to the ones found by Maggie. Okay. So, which gives another concern. I've got the same load as the shot shells and multiple guns and 300 blackout that match the ones found on your property. So you now believe that those guns, that Paul's guns were used? Yes. Okay. And missing. And I understand that somebody had seen that gun recently, but, you know, and I'd ask Buster about it. Um, I, I believe that that gun has been gone since back before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, no one do. no one recalls Paul's first 300 going missing around Halloween at a party at Hampton. Halloween of 2020? When, when did y'all? No, that because that no, was no, 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 it, it was years. Yeah, it, was, it, it was whatever. Another part in the 911 call. You made the comment, I should have known. And the question that's around it, um, you know, dispatcher's asking, is anybody else supposed to be at the house? Um, and you said, no, ma'am, please hurry. Um, and she says, we're getting somebody out there to you. And your next comment was, I should have known. What are you referencing in that statement? I don't remember saying that, but I guess, you know, all the threats and, you know, and I had been convinced that this was something to do with the boat wreck and, you know, all of that. Did Paul ever get physical with you? Did you ever get into a heated argument and get physical? One time, I mean, a, a little bit where he wouldn't listen to me. Did you ever get physical with him? No, sir. How about Maggie? Did Paul get physical with Maggie? No. Yeah. Sure, she probably wanted to at times. I mean, uh, she, she wanted to with all of us. Yeah. And the one time Paul did that he had had too much to drink mm -hmm. um, in a very isolated incident. Where was that? Was that at Moselle or at a stove? That was at uh, Moselle. So that was pretty recent? No, sir. It had been a while. When you turned Paul over, and his cell phone popped out and you picked it up and 
your statement was something like, um, I thought about doing something, but then I put it back down. And that was the interview, our first interview. What, what were your intentions with the phone? I don't know. I mean, it when I when I um, went up to him and the, the phone came out. I don't remember having intentions of doing anything with the phone. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so um, what's interesting now is this interview. We're seeing a, a, a lot of uh, adapting there, a lot of trying to manage, I believe, you know, his own stress around this. And this is tricky for anybody, anybody. I mean, just put yourself in a position where you are interviewing somebody else for a job. So it's not even, it's not even an interrogation like this. You're interviewing somebody for a job and you want to do a really good job because you want to make sure that you get the right person for it. You're going to be under stress. And the interviewer here is under stress as well. And here's where we're seeing this person manage their own stress at this time. I think managing it very, very well, but it, but it's more marked at this point than a lot of the body language from the subject, uh, though there is some good stuff from the subject in just, in just one moment. Uh, now also we see him go and adapt at the papers as well. He moves around the papers for no real reason. I don't think he's doing it for dramatic effect. He's just trying to find something to do to deal with his stress around this. Um, so, you know, the question is, is like, you know, how do you manage your stress in these situations? Because everybody feels it and everybody needs not only training in how to get information out of people, but training in how to manage yourself in that interview so that you don't, you know, corrupt it with your own problems in there. Okay, here's what's happening in the subject. When I went up to him, there's then a change in that baseline that he's now established, he's locked into, and he goes to protect his knee and barriers. Again, the knee, really important joint on the body. If the knee gets damaged, you're in big trouble. I, I dislocated my knee uh, about six, seven, eight months ago or something like that. And it's hard to walk, like it's hard to walk when you, so you don't want that lit, that, that joint you know, damaged in any way. So under stress and pressure, the knee is an area. We also see people will go down and touch the ankle. Prince Harry does that. He'll go down and touch his ankle. Zero reason to do it. There's nothing wrong with his foot. He's not, the foot's not going to disappear anywhere, but he kind of thinks you can't, it's a habit that he's got into. You won't be able to see me adapting on my ankle. Again, tricky joint. He then goes on to say, I didn't have any intention of doing anything with the phone. So here's what I'd say, because he protects the knee. He did have some intention of doing something with that phone. Yeah, I'm going to gamble that that is probably inaccurate as to what he's saying there. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I, I, I think the stress with the detective is from it's not from it's not stress. It's more of a thing where he's thinking about all the thing he's things he's got all the he's he's looking at all the information he's got. He's putting everything in order. That's what it looks like to me. When I'm thinking, I always do this, or I put my hands up around my mouth and people complain about it and all that when they when I do it on here. But I think that's what this guy's doing. He's thinking about all the stuff he's got. He's like, and, and it's more of a positive thing than than a stress reliever, reliever from being something negative, built up, bad stress. That's yeah, what cognitive like load. Yeah, cognitive load. Yeah. When yeah. I say stress, I'm not saying negative or positive. Just okay, you know, okay, gotcha. load that you gotcha. didn't gotcha. that you don't necessarily need. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, because that that's I've been in that spot before. And so we all have. So th that's the way I, that's the way it looks like to me anyway. But again, the bobbin's going strong here and he's <clears throat> laser focused on that interrogator because he, he didn't put much thought into the 911 call. He didn't think it would be dissected. He didn't think it would be brought out phrase by phrase, word by word. He, he remembers pretty much the story he's talking about, but he doesn't remember all the little tiny details. And those that he does remember, he be, he's sure to lean into them. Like when he talks about, and he throws his kid under the bus again and blames this whole thing on his child that he killed. You know, that this is a dirty guy here. This is, this is, this is not, this is a low, I have, you know, that's using, 
language we can use on here. But when he's asked if he's been, been <clears throat> excuse me, violent with Paul, that's when we see uh, the most movement in that right hand. That's when it starts going the most. He's remembering that violent uh, situation, and that's that's the way he that's the way he's trying to because I'm sure it was pretty violent. That kid came at him, you know, what it wasn't good for the kid uh, by the time it was over because that Murdoch was a big boy, and uh, this is. Um, I think this is good because we see him trying to stay composed. He's trying to stay under control and he tries hard to look natural. So it doesn't look odd, but it does look odd because it's not natural. We see him trying to hold, hold those things back with all of his adapters and, and everything he's doing, trying to stay straight and, and all bunched up like that. Um, and it's so his confidence that he's trying to show really doesn't come through that way. It just looks and sounds odd. Um, all right, Chase, what do you got? So let's just examine a little bit here. There's no mention of detail about the crime that occurred, like ever. There's not mention of murder or being shot or someone killing someone or guns. Not one uh, desire to find out who did this. Not one ounce of anger. Not one ounce of guilt, which normal people tend to have just under the under the assumption they could have maybe prevented something from happening. If I would have only done X, then Y wouldn't have happened. And there's no mention of how the bodies looked, but the detail and the very specific, carefully executed phone description uh, is just astonishing here to me. And this is an example of a detail valley and a detail spike. And it suggests extreme deception to me and that there's something with this phone that is key to the case. So if this has not gone to trial yet, I would say that phone holds something there. And when he says you ever get physical with him, when he's talking about Paul, he's saying, no, sir, there's a quick head shake. And then he goes back to nodding. And Maggie mm -hmm. is just, no, it's more direct, more confident, and there's a more firm head shake. So these are two kind of a, just apart from each other. And I'll let you determine whatever that means. And in interrogations, it is your job to help somebody soften the severity of the case, to help them carefully just come to the conclusion that they can confess. And I would say no matter what, your job is to go, whether there's an attorney in there or not, it doesn't change the desired outcome. So there's a quote from Sun Tzu that I have on the first page of all my interrogation manuals that when I train students and police, and this is build your opponent a golden bridge on which to retreat. So when your suspect is as bad a liar as this, you'll have actually more work to do. But they'll. the cool thing is they're definitely going to show you the blueprint of what that bridge is supposed to look like. What do they need to hear? And interrogators essentially have seven core jobs. And this is me just going through the interrogation training here for you. We have to minimize, socialize, project, justify, rationalize, emphasize the truth, and increase anxiety associated with deception. Those are the main jobs of an interrogator. And we're not seeing a whole lot of that here. Maybe we will uh, later on, but I wish we had seen a little bit more. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, in the course of interrogation, there is a golden tool that you use, and it's called futility. And only good interrogators are any good with it. Everything we do, everything Chase just said, all of that, is about one thing. It's about getting that person to the point they have a realization they can't resist you. And the hardest thing for a person to get is that. I mean, in my days of teaching interrogation, they would stand up and sound like Picard from uh, Star Trek saying, resistance is futile, and you'd fire them. You'd put them right out of the interrogation room and say, no, come back. This is about subtlety of message. It's about getting the person to realize that you have more ammunition than they do and they're going to lose the war that's really at the end of the day what we do there are lots of ways some are some are coercive in some parts of the world some are non-coercive my style is non-coercive some like reed has another set of tools all of these work on that one thing that a person gets to a point they realize there's no re reason to resist to resist because they're not going to win what we see here mark i love that you're talking about the investigator because i think what we're seeing here is some masterful interrogation that you only have to be able to know what he's doing to figure out why the stress is there. He has a job and that job is to hide the key crux of the matter. And he brings up a crux question in here. What were you going to do with that phone? That's why he's here. 
He wants to know because this is, they already know now that he was down at the kennel and he's trying to find out, is that guy trying to get rid of it? So all that stuff he's doing is kind of a redirect. If you watch magicians, you guys are big fans of magicians more than I am. They're redirecting while they're doing something with the other hand. That's what he's doing. And I always say an interrogator is like a swan. They look elegant and floating along the top of the water, but they're paddling like hell underneath. And you can see it. He's paddling like hell right here. He's trying to keep his head above water. Mark, you're picking up on that and seeing that stress. We see this is, I'm going to go a little bit long in this one because this is probably one of the most powerful ones we're going to see. But we start off by watching Murda do a rapid short stroke of the thing he always does. Watch how short stroked he is as he's doing. And he's asked about the 911 call because that's what he thinks this is about. Now you see that tissue in his right hand starting to take the crux of all these things that are going on. Something else changes. Have you heard him say, you know, ever until now? He starts now to have filler words, you know, you know, you know. He also goes to partial sentences and phrases. Okay, that's a fairly common Southern speech pattern around where I live and around where he lives, but he doesn't use it. This is the first time I've heard it. As soon as this guy looks away, watch when the investigator takes a second and looks away and watch that explosion of movement. Just crazy, only to lock right back down. Right there enough is enough for me to say, why the hell are you doing this? Then we see really big rocking when he's asked about his son. And he says he wouldn't listen to me. The one missed question here is how physical did you get? I would have asked that just to fire across the bow and say, I think you're violent and, but I think he does a great job of containing it. And then Paul or, or Murdoch gives out useless information. When he talks about alcohol, but watch him. When you see that thing where he covers his knee mark, that's in response to the crux question. When he asked that crux question, his hands go out to block that knee. And you could say it's because he's been so balled up. He needed to move out to get to there. Or it could be the knee, or it could be both. But something caused him to do that. And then he gets back to keen on locking everything down. If you're being interrogated, dropping your hands in your lap while you're fig leafing, if nothing ever changes, it's just fig leafing. And so what? It's just your baseline. Now, the only problem with putting your hand on your knee is we can see everything. You're like a little meter there. This is a big deviation from baseline and powerful, powerful interrogation step. The eyewitness is you. Another part in the 911 call, um, you made the comment, I should have known. And the question that surrounded, um, you know, dispatchers asking, is anybody else supposed to be at the house? Um, and you said, no, ma'am, please hurry. Um, and she says, we're getting somebody out there to you. And your next comment was, I should have known. What are you referencing in that statement? I don't remember saying that, but I guess, you know, all the threats and you know and i had been convinced that this was something to do with the boat wreck and you know all of that physical with you ever get into a heated argument and get physical one time i mean a, a little bit where he wouldn't listen to me did you ever get physical with him no sir i'm not maggie did paul get physical with maggie no sure she probably wanted to at times i mean no, she, she wanted to with all of us yeah And the one time Paul did that, he had had too much to drink mm -hmm. um, in a very isolated incident. Where was that? Was that at Moselle or at a stove? That was at uh, Moselle. So that was pretty recent? No, sir. It had been a while. When you turned Paul over and his cell phone popped out and you picked it up and your statement was something like, um, I thought about doing something, but then I put it back down. And that was the interview, our first interview. What, what were your intentions with the phone? I don't know. I mean, it, when I, when I uh, went up to him and the phone came out. I don't remember. 
remember having intentions of doing anything with the phone. Dispatcher, hour two hours ago. Hour and a half to two hours. Hour ago. and a half two hours. What time was the 911 call? 10:06 p.m. Hour and a half two hours prior to that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. And you're having trouble coming up with a specific time. Oh, yes, there. I don't. I. I, I tell me again what I said to the. Um, Dispatcher. You said an hour and a half ago, probably two hours. And what time was that? That was when you were on the phone um, and the 911 call was made at 10 06. So given two hours back, that would have been eight. I mean, I think that's probably about, I think that's probably about right. And so you, what do you believe I'm giving you an inconsistent answer? No, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it when I'm asking you what time you went to the office that day, what time you got home. At this point in the investigation, did you have the video back from Paul's phone showing the dog at the kennels? No, sir, I had not. Um, you're, you know, you're saying 5 or 5.30. I've got the card readout from the law firm, and it shows you going in at 5 or 5.30. You're going in the door? Yes, sir. Randy says when he left about six o'clock, you were still there. So the times aren't matching up, and I'm just trying to get—I'm I'm, I'm just trying to get an understanding of why. I believe I left. So the, the, that's not the first time I was at my office that day. There were several readings, but your card wouldn't work. Somebody had to actually had to let you in. Okay, but, I, but I've got your card opening the door at the law firm at 5.30. Okay. And then Randy saying. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, what interests me now is this yellow shirted interviewer, the one that we can't really see uh, too much of. You can see uh, his breathing rate because you can see his stomach, his diaphragm moving. So you can have a look at where his breathing rate is and and to all the points that have been made so far, look, the, you're, you're in this situation, let's assume probably rightly that they are looking, whether it's unreasonable or not, looking to move somebody to a confession. You know, it could be unreasonable in this situation, but that's where they're going. And there's an element of nonverbal, which is about time, like how quickly does so, or slowly does something happen? And, and how quickly or slowly something happens has effect on human beings, and it often shows up in their nonverbal behavior. I think we're seeing from the yellow shirted interviewer that he would like this to be happening a whole lot quicker 
than it is. And so it, it, it takes me back to the other interviewer and, and what again, what I would call the, sh- the stress that's happening there, which is, you know, the cognitive load that not that he's out of control with things, but he would like probably a, a, a better pace on it. I mean, who wouldn't like to get something done faster rather than slower? So n- not only when you're thinking about how you might do interviews, whether it's in this kind of situation or something, you know, with with a little less risk in it, maybe, but, you know, even interviewing somebody for a job, there's a lot of risk involved with that. You've got to understand the pressures of time and what you're liable to do under these pressures of time. And I think in this situation, we've got somebody here going, you know what, I'd like this to be happening a lot quicker than it is. So interesting uh, to to see that. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? I almost did that. That didn't go on as long as I would have liked it to. Luckily, Zoom has an <laughs> alert that comes up now when you're on mute. Oh, with, <laughs> that's that just... been gone forever then, isn't it? <laughs> so I believe he told his attorney he was innocent. I believe that that's what he said to his attorney. And you can I think you can tell here because he's not looking back at him very often. Uh, for advice or anything. And I'm going to say something that's critical of interrogation training, but I'm not talking about this particular officer. This is a unique case where he's literally interrogating a former prosecutor. This whole series of clips still does illustrate why it's important not to follow just some blind step-by-step checklist for interrogations. And one of the biggest damaging mistakes that I've seen in every police department, every one that I've given training to, including the military, is they have zero training on how to understand the person that they're speaking to. And so many departments get kind of a washed down version of interrogation training, and none of them teach interrogators to understand the phrases, the approaches, the techniques, and specific words that are going to influence certain types of people, and then how to tell which type I'm talking to right now. So essentially, most interrogation training is kind of this basic lockpick where they're taught to just jiggle this lock pick in the lock for hours in hopes that a confession is going to come out or information is going to come out when all they needed was the key, which is kind of the right words that the person, their psychology, the suspect's psychology will respond to. And as the key lesson from this video, take a look at Murdoch's behavior. It is restrained. Now, lots of people get nervous in the interrogation room. Lots of people get stressed out, innocent and guilty but only some conceal and restrain those behaviors of stress. And we're definitely seeing that here. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree. I think this is from this point on, uh, this is where he's beginning to realize that things aren't going to go his way. That's why it's starting to get a little bit more odd looking and, and things start ramping up a little bit. He knows he, he messed up and his brain is scrambling to fix all that stuff. Is scrambling, is scrambling to keep his story straight, scrambling to, to remember what he said and what he's done up to this point. That's I'm just giving the overall body language uh, view, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a good one because it, we see a new adapter. We see he starts off by doing his normal foot moving, rocking, doing all that, but then he twists in his chair. That's something new. Why do you do that? Don't know. Don't know. We always say. It doesn't matter why, it makes me want to know why. So then we go there. Then he uses a delaying technique, tell me again. That gives him time to think. And as soon as he gets done with that, he does two-handed adapting, pulling it close and squeezing his arm. There's a lot going on here. Then there's a negotiated answer with a little to the end. That's probably about right. Well, Chase, I think you usually say innocent people are comfortable introducing ambiguity. Let me give you a great example of that. If this happened to me, I would say, hell, I don't know what time it was. I came home, my wife and child were dead. It could have been 20 hours. Hell, I don't know. My brain was not working. But we don't hear that. We hear that overly helpful. And people who don't know how to resist interrogation always think that if I'm just helpful, they'll leave me alone. That's why it works that way. The eyewitness is you. One thing that I'm trying to understand is your timeline. You said you probably went to the office at 30, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and you left early around 5 or 5.30. <clears throat> um, and there's been some other timelines or times that we've talked about, and you can't quite remember um, what the times are or what time of day it was. When the dispatcher asked you 
when was the last time you saw Maggie or told Maggie? And he said an hour and a half, two hours ago. To me, that's, you know, a set, without thinking about it, you rattled off that time. Um, we're sitting here trying to figure out a timeline. Your question was, you told the dispatcher hour, two hours ago? Hour and a half to two hours. Hour ago. and a half to two hours. What time was the 911 call? 10.06 p.m. Hour and a half to two hours prior to that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. And you're having trouble coming up with a specific time. Oh, yes, there. I don't know. Uh, I, I, tell me again what I said to the um, dispatcher. You said an hour and a half ago, probably two hours. And what time was that? That was when you were on the phone uh, and the 911 call was made at 10.06. So given two hours back, that would have been eight. I mean, I think that's probably about, I think that's probably about right. And so you, what do you believe I'm giving you an inconsistent answer? No, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it when I'm asking you what time you went to the office that day. What time you got home? Can I, can I ask you a question? Yes. At this point in the investigation, did you have the video back from Paul's phone showing the dog at the kennels? No, sir, I had not. Um, you're, you know, you're saying five or five thirty. I've gotten the car readout from the law firm, and it shows you going in at five five thirty. Going in the door? Yes, sir. And Randy says when he left about six o'clock, you were still there. So the times aren't matching up. And I'm just trying to get I, I'm, I'm just trying to get an understanding of why. I believe I left. So the, the, that's not the first time I was at my office that day. There were several readings, but your card wouldn't work. Somebody had to actually had to let you in. Okay. I, but I've got your card opening the door at the law firm at 5.30. Okay. And then Randy saying, and then Randy saying when he left at 6, you were still there. I'm just, I'm trying to understand. You know, I, I left the office earlier than I normally did. What's your, what's your normal time to leave? I mean, it's not unusual for me to be there till dark. You know, I try to get home when Maggie's home, you know, before dark. She don't like staying out there by herself in dark. That's right. So, you know, if it was 5.30 or 6, I, you know, I don't think I was still there at 6 o'clock. Okay. But... Um, you know, if I was, it wasn't long after that. Okay. So, you know, I went, I believe that I went straight home. So, you know, my car, have y'all been able to get Chevrolet to download my? We're still working on that. Okay. Long process. Well, I mean, I got home <coughs> early enough for Paul and I to ride the property for a substantial length of time. You know, more than an hour. I thought probably a couple of hours okay. that we were together, but somewhere. Took her down the river. We rode down um, all the roads. I believe. I believe that we. I mean, we rode all over. Okay. We rode all over.
Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this starts off with non-pertinent information, but the heat is really up still. So he's he's adapting still. He's doing all of his usual stuff, squeezing and rubbing and swirling in the chair. But now he starts to talk about conditions. He starts to condition everything he says with, I believe. And that's a cutout word because I can always say, well, I said, I believe. I don't know. No, maybe I was wrong. That's not the way people typically do it. This is, leads him to say, I believe I was, that's not a lie and all that kind of stuff we've heard from him. But he really rocks. He really rocks when they ask him about Chevrolet and talking to OnStar. Because if you don't know what your car is tracking, it's tracking everything, just so you know that. If you're not aware of that, unless you're driving something really old, your car's tracking everything. We've, I've had a friend who had an accident and they were able to tell exactly what happened before the accident. He goes back to his normal speech patterns. No more, no more phrases, long sentences on non-pertinent information about riding the property. But when he's asked about the river, or I think it's the river he asks the questions for, he loses his ability to construct a sentence. What happened down there? What caused all this? Might have started there, don't know, but something changed. And then he changed. And then he goes back and he interrupts himself with, I believe that we. That believe is part of his defense later. That's my opinion. Scott, what do you got? All right. He's locked down. He does move a little bit more than he has been. A a lot more, actually. And those are just signs of stress. That's all I'm going to add to that because I'm trying to stay on the body language thing. I really didn't get into the what he's saying back and forth. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, let me just dig into the central theme of of all of this and, and why it confuses me as to the theme that you'd choose if you were innocent. He spent, I don't know how long this interview has been going on now, but he spent all the time defending his position, answering in some way, and by often not answering or I don't remember, but but you know, committing to the interview that's going on rather than saying, stop these ridiculous questions. I, I'm nothing to do with this. Find the people who did this or person who did this to my son and my wife. And if they continued asking these questions, then going, you two are a bunch of idiots and I want you out of here right now. I want a senior, I want the most senior person at this station in the room with me right now and I want this dealt with. That's where I'd be at this point because I wouldn't have killed my my wife and my son. I don't know. Well, I do know why he's not there because he's done it. I mean, that's why. That's why he's only and 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 so you know as as a fundamental rule, if he's spending all of this time defending himself when he could just go, shut up the both of you. I'm nothing to do with this. Get me somebody who's an investigator in the room. If he's not going down that route, I gotta wonder why. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think uh, Mark, you stole my notes on this oh. one. <laughs> this I'm sneaky. <laughs> this is a pronounced focus. I'm just going to like summarize what you're saying just so people can get this. There's a pronounced focus on innocence and the, a disappearance of a person who might have done this or a desire to find out what really happened. There's no desire there. And this is plain and simple to diagnose. This is where all attention of law enforcement should be placed. And it's so rare to see this in innocent people. This kind of behavior is so incredibly rare that I'm going to make an unprecedented statement here that if you see this, this alone has the potential to serve as the guidepost for where law enforcement should be paying all of their attention. If you see behavior like this in this clip. The eyewitness is you. And then Randy saying when he left at six, you were still there. I'm just, I'm trying to understand. You know, I, I left the office earlier than I normally do. What's, you your, know? what's your normal time to leave? I mean, it's not unusual for me to be there till dark. You know, I try to get home when Maggie's home, you know, before dark. She don't like staying out there by herself in dark. That's right. So, you know. If it was 5.30 or 6, you know, I don't think I was still there at 6 o'clock. But, um, you know, if I was, it wasn't long after that. So, you know, I went 
I believe that I went straight home. So, you know, my car, have y'all been able to get Chevrolet to download my? We're still working on that. Okay. That's a long process. Well, I mean, I got home early enough for Paul and I to ride the property for a substantial length of time. You know, more than an hour, I thought probably a couple of hours okay. that we were together, but somewhere. Did you go down the river? We rode down um, all the roads, I believe. I believe that we I mean, we rode all over. We rode all over. <coughs> you know, we've already established family guns were used. And if they came from Paul's truck, Paul's truck was at the house. So where where were they? And how did they get down there? And how did they get down there? I mean, it, it's normal for y'all to leave your keys in the cars. However, if somebody showed up and did this, you're not going to take Paul's truck back to the house and leave the key in it. I mean, do you know that they... The guns were in the truck. I mean, could they have been somewhere else? They could have been somewhere else. I mean, he wasn't taking. He didn't have his normal truck. And I understand that Nolan Tootin believes he saw the, uh, the gun um, three weeks beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I haven't talked to him, but is, is it is he believes it was the one that not the one that was at the house. Greg, what do you got? So he's heated up here pretty good because he does a couple of things I've never seen in the interrogation room. One of them is he tries a fig leaf while crossing his legs. And I said, he's doing a Sharon Stone leg cross moment. If you're not old enough to remember the Sharon Stone movie, Basic Instinct, he does a big move like that. And it's just not something you see every day. That's over the top. What we see often in people prior to confession, I don't mean right as they confess, but as they're headed toward the confession, is they get this locked down as he is here, their chin drops to protect their throat. Look at him. Compare his chin now back to one and see are we seeing any of that deviation. But what we see then often is their feet hunt the door, and that's a predecessor. And then we put the pressure, pressure, pressure. Then we give them silence, let them simmer a little bit. And then we go for the close. I'll bet if you could see his feet, they're pointing for the door already at this point, just to tell us what's going on in his head. Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, it's nothing but an agreement with what you've said. The the only note that I had here, because for me it seemed the only thing of of big consequence, is his hand is now tucked right in at his groin area, protecting those primary sexual characteristics. I think that's a deviation from everything that we've seen so far. Yes, he's been locked down. Yes, he's been protective. But he's now shielding these knuckle joints in his legs and his primary sexual characteristics at the same time, you know, something is is up. Something is a little more extreme. Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think this one's really interesting because this is the fastest uh, bobbing back and forth we've seen so far. And his breath rate is up, his, he's, breathing, he's breathing faster and deeper. And, that's, and that, I think that's a dramatic change at this point. His voice tone and his diction, they're the clearest they've been so far, clearest and cleanest. And I think this is because he got a little adrenaline pop during this. And he's realizing there are even more things he didn't work out properly. So he's having to slow down and think about what's happening and what's happened so far. He's still got all these parts of the story swirling around his head trying to get that stuff worked out. And again, he doesn't have the answer for these questions. So his stress level is is through the roof on this compared to what we've seen so far. And his lawyer can't even help him. And his lawyer's got his, his legs crossed as well, which I thought was interesting. But the, it's opposite of of uh, Murdoch's. So I thought that was, that was, anyway, pretty interesting. Greg, what do you got? Oh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree completely. And... If if somebody if you see somebody having trouble completing a sentence the moment a murder weapon is introduced to the conversation, there's something happening. There's something maybe significant going on. And if the person also then corrects you on the caliber of the weapon so that it's not involved with the crime, that might also be a big deal. And that's all I got. The eyewitness is you. You know, we've already established family guns were used. And if they came from Paul's truck, Paul's truck was at the house. So where where were they? And how did they get down there? How did they get down there? I mean, it, it's normal for y'all to leave your keys in the cars. However, if somebody showed up and did this, you're not going to take Paul's truck back to the house and leave the key in it. I mean, do you know that the, the guns were in the truck? I mean, could they have been somewhere else? They could have been somewhere else. I mean, he wasn't taking, he didn't have his normal truck. And I understand that Nolan Tootin believes he saw the, uh, the gun um, three weeks beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I haven't talked to him, but is, is it, is he believes it was the one that, not the one that was at the house. Did you kill Paul? No, I did not kill Paul. 
Do you know who did? No, sir, I do not know who did. Do you think I killed Maggie? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me. I understand that. And you think I killed Paul? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me, and I don't have anything that points to anybody else at this time. So does that mean that I am a suspect? You were still in, like I told Corey earlier, you were still in this. With, with, it, with everything that we've talked about, with the family guns, the ammunition, nobody else's DNA. aside and go with the facts. I'll go first on this one. Uh, this is a classic uh, non-contraction of the denial. And so when he asked if he killed his wife, he said, no, I did not kill my wife. And he doesn't say, no, I didn't. Instead of saying, no, I didn't, he says, no, I did not. Now, I've, I've come to the point in my life where, where I see that sometimes as that person may be making sure they get everything about that, that statement correct. And they're trying to ram that home. So that's why they don't contract. So I think maybe in, in this situation, I'm kind of on the fence about this one. It's not, it's non contracted, but it didn't, the flow of it isn't the one, isn't the, the flow you usually see when somebody says, no, I did not. It was very slow. It was very, Da, da, da. So I think he's he was ready for that, and I think he was um, he's trying to make sure that point gets across. I don't I don't think it's um, a, a subconscious or you know a non conscious situation there. Um, so these days I'm 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 on the fence about all that, and this is one of the things that puts me on the fence about it. Um, yeah, because I thought about that for a long time. Um, I think this his I think that answer is probably rehearsed. I think at some point he said to himself because he hasn't been able to discuss it with his lawyer because like I think you were saying we, Greg were you the one that said do you think he's uh, Chase Chase okay yeah I think you might be right I think he, he told the guy he was innocent yeah I guess you you have to say that you didn't do it so they can you know in some cases depending on your relationship with him. But I would think, knowing this guy's personality and the people he hangs out with, I think he may have told the guy the truth, you know. So, I, you know, dirty hangs out with dirty, man, birds of a feather. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this was beautifully executed by the, the, the detective. At the end, he says, I have to put my beliefs aside and go with the facts. There's this little tether of trust you must keep between you and the person you're talking to. Because as soon as they're under the impression you're not there to help them, then everything changes. I know in this room, it's it's like a you know a party in there. There's so many people in there, but you must keep that thing. You must you've got to keep that trust thing happening there, so they'll be able to, to confide. You know, feel like they're confiding you. He's not going to confide in three other people. You know, in three people, he would have done it with one. But and I think you're you're right in this case. There there's three people in there. It's 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 not going to happen. And you can see that I think from the beginning that that it's not going to happen. But it, but the but the detective detective I really think he does a great job in keeping that little tether man keeping that still strong by saying uh, what he said and if if somebody out there knows this guy the the detective or you or you know how to get a hold of him yeah. please have him get a hold of us and and get a hold of us at the behavior panel at gmail dot com the behavior panel at gmail dot com and if there's no U in behavior that one's already gone when we get we had to get the one with no no U in it. So it's the behavior panel uh, at gmail.com. Have them email us here if you would. and Or if you see this, go ahead and email us there. Chase, what do you got? So we're seeing this classic nodding uh, again throughout this. And look at the spots when the nod, I just want you to, I'm not going to tell you where it is. Look at the spots where the nodding spikes, where it gets to its, its peak point. And there's question repetition with psychological distancing so he's not saying the name he says my wife this time and he uses the officer's name this time during a denial 
which is way, way out of baseline. As for this entire long video, it's out of baseline. His body is freezing, which means that he's not really adapting or doing anything. He's completely locked. So we're not seeing a whole lot of movement. Then there's the non-contracted denial there. But we're seeing that non-contracted denial also added with partial repetition or what, what we call in my training repetition of a question fragment, which is repeated with the denial. No, I did not kill my wife. And then he's still nodding. And with every other denial that was truthful, he had a very positive head shake like this, but he's still nodding in here, which it, this is a rare case where those are out of baseline. It's uncharacteristic. So this head nodding means something during the denials it, or potentially does. And this is not necessarily he's doing a great job here, uh, but this is not how a classic trained confrontation is supposed to go granted the attorneys in the room so it's a little bit different and there's actually a six-step protocol to make a direct confrontation to another person and let them know they're a suspect you don't believe them and not uh i don't think any of those six steps are in this clip but one huge one from that protocol is using the suspect's name especially during this time when you want to develop that little line of trust that Scott was talking about, that's when you want to lean out there and use that person's name. And that's when, you know, Scott is a big fan of kind of reaching out, touching their knee and saying, listen, I think you're a good person. And I just want to figure out, you know, why this happened. And, you know, maybe you were out of your mind or whatever, but I'm not blaming the officer or the detective here at all. The interrogation uh, that a lot of people receive is pretty minimal, but I know he's doing his best, and it's a damn good job. And I'm not uh, discounting that he's extremely good at what he does as a detective there. Um, Greg? Yeah, so let's talk for a minute about that thin line of trust or whatever you want to call it. Everything we do, I contend, is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And for me to get you to give me something or to want to do something for me, I have to create a new sense of belonging. And the magic of what we do, whether it's elicitation or it's interrogation, any of that is based on me creating a new normal where you belong to a tribe I belong to. And that's exactly what you have to do. If I am screaming and yelling and throwing stuff at you, you're not going to do anything for me. You might do it for someone to get away from me. So all those tools, even if you are calling a person a liar, even if you're going at them, it's about keeping that thin line of trust, as you called it, Scott. So I'll, I'll call it the same thing. That thin line of trust creates a new normal where I can then approach you and make you feel guilty for lying to me or make you feel guilty for not being coming forward with some piece of information. So let's talk about what's clear here. The very first thing he says is no. He just does a fading facts. He reminds me of our friend Candace Bly on Dr. Phil. No, just disappears. But then he restates after he repeats the question, did I kill my wife? He does that non-contracted denial. We've been hearing him use phrases a lot. And now this non-contracted denial. I mean, you Scott, it doesn't always mean something except when it does. His chin is down. We usually associate with shame, not up and defiant. We usually associate with indignant or that kind of thing. That non-contracted denial on his son. He There's a politeness spike. No, sir, I did not. When he does, did you kill Paul? It's interesting that all this works. Scott, we were at Dr. Phil and they gave me the disclaimer. And Scott said, oh, you can tell who's in the military because they asked me a question. I repeated the question as I affirmed it because that's the way my brain works. That's not the way his brain works. But listen to him do it here. He's doing it here very specifically. Sounds like me disclaiming. And then after he's told he's a suspect, his eyes drop down to his left, which we associate with internal conversation, and then down into the right which we associate with emotion and then lip compression. What we know is pre-confession body language is locked up, locked up, locked up, go down into this kinesthetic down, left, down, right, down, left, down, right. And then they open. Well, he's not going to open with somebody sitting beside him who is part of his Maslow. As long as there's a, a room full of people and especially one of them, somebody he's associated with, he's not going to confess in a crowd. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so look, I think the key to critical thinking is to be agnostic about absolutely everything. And so you're right. Anybody is right to be on the fence about any one signal. And all we're doing is going, look, we're on the fence about everything until the, enough mounts up that if you went to the casino, 
what would you gamble on the accuracy of your judgment based on being on the fence about everything until the information piles up? And that's just being intelligent, which is not making snap judgments because your instinct does that on its own. It, like it doesn't even need to eat to do that. Your instinct takes microwatts of energy, whereas your intelligent brain that does critical thinking, it's like a, it's, 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 it's a 40 watt light bulb of energy to get that going. So you do have to be comfortable. You got to eat enough in order to get that working. You don't do critical thinking by accident. You do it on purpose. And we're getting so much information here mounting up that puts us in the direction of, of, He's been up to something. It's not good news for him. I want to put on top of that, we then get his lawyer doing lint picking, which is, you know, where you take some piece of dust. Uh, he's not doing it from his lapel, by the way, but he's doing it on his knee. I'm just showing you that so you can see it. And, and it is often a show of indifference, a show of there isn't enough power out there. I've got time to make sure there are no flies on me. There are no, there's no dirt on me. I don't, I'm not feeling the stress and pressure uh, outside in this environment. Well, interesting that this lawyer who is attached to, to their client. They have a relationship with their client that the others in the room don't have. It's meant to be a supportive relationship. And you've got this person with the supportive relationship doing lint picking at this point. Now, do we know what that means? Like we, we know it tends to show indifference. Is it him going, oh, now would be the time to get rid of this client? Uh, you know, I'm going to be indifferent to my relationship with this client. It could be that. That's quite a nice idea. Or is he signaling to the others in the room? I don't think you've got anything, you know, or is he signaling? You've got something there. You're onto something, but I want to show you that you have nothing. I don't know which, which one it is. I'd have to turn to the person and go, Hey, what's going on for you right now? What's going on there? Look, let's couple with that. Um, we now get the subject leaning forward <clears throat> and saying, do you think I did it? Well, this is compounding what's happening. And this is a question I believe that would have been if somebody was innocent, they'd have asked right at the start, right at the start, they'd have gone, do you think I, what, what's this about? Do you think I did it? If they said yes, then the person would have gone, okay, what evidence you have? Because I didn't do it. Like, let's get through this for, because we need to go and find the person who killed my wife and my kid fast. Cause I want justice. And none of that has happened clearly. Uh, not a good, not a good show going on here. I think that's all. The eyewitness is you. Thank you, man. Yeah. I just Thank saw you. a few more questions. Okay. Did you kill Maggie? No. Did I kill my wife? Yes, sir. No, David. Do you know who did? No, I do not know who did. Did you kill Paul? No, I did not kill Paul. Do you know who did? No, sir, I do not know who did. Do you think I killed Maggie? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me. I understand that. And you think I killed Paul? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me. And I don't have anything that points to anybody else at this time. So does that mean that I am a suspect? You were still in, like I told Corey earlier, you were still in this. With, with, it, with everything that we've talked about, with the family guns, the ammunition, nobody else's DNA. I have to put my beliefs aside and go with the facts. Talk with Mr. Griffin, there's one sentence after that. So, Mark, so far, what have you seen up to this point? So far, 
I believe what we've seen is some of the most interesting and subtlest indicators in an any interrogation that we've looked at as to what's going on, the battle that's going on. Both these parties uh, are doing a great job to attack and defend under a lot of pressure for both parties. And I think what we've picked up on here is some real subtleties of what's going on, indicating that continued battle. Chase, what are you seeing so far? So, so far, I think this is one of the first, if not the first interrogation videos that we've analyzed where every single video contains massive red flags. It's normal for us to get some, but in this one, it is incredible. Like every video here. And I, this, all these videos are a testament to how important psychology is in interrogations. And I think the interrogator did do a great job. It is, I cannot imagine the insurmountable uh, task of interrogating a former prosecutor with his attorney sitting next to him. There's somebody else, maybe one of my senior people, what it, from what it looked like, sitting next to me. Uh, so that would be really tough. And he brought up all the key elements of the scene, and I'm no detective by any means, so I know that's its own entire area of expertise, but I will certainly be using these for training uh, in, in my classes. Greg? Yeah, so far what I see is this is a guy on a fishing expedition. He's in to figure out what they know. Now we know that he has done a lot of heinous stuff by now. We know all the facts that came out in, in the court case. But without that, without the ability to see what's going on in the interrogation, you might miss all of this because the subtlety of body language, the mistake of coming in locked down and trying to resist interrogation like you think people do, and then watching it unfold as an interrogator does his job is powerful. I think what we're seeing here is some places that gave them a place to drill down when they went on the stand. I know that I would go after that crux question for sure. You also saw some stress up to now working on the pro on the person who is asking the questions. Interrogation is a complex thing. It's an art form and it's designed for the person sitting across from you. I think he did a good job, all things considered with a person sitting. And again, we've said this many times, we'll say it again, love to have you on the show, love to talk to you, love to know more about what you were thinking when you're doing this. Scott, what are you seeing? Yeah, I agree. I, I hope he does. I hope somebody gets a hold of him or he he hears about this and and comes and talks to us. That'd be awesome. Uh, I think so, I think this is a great example of of seeing someone go through the process of not sure if they're going to get in trouble or not to being pretty dang sure they've had it uh, or th that everyone's on to them. I think they that's a great a great example of that. And I think the uh, detective did a wonderful job of that because he kept his cool and he never really, he never changed from that little plane he was riding down that little, just flat and right there. I think, I think he did a great job uh, doing that, but we did see a lot of little things that you, that will usually just blow right by because there's so many big things happening in an interrogation that we can point out and the little things become boring. But in this case, it was all the little things that were huge that made such a big difference for this one, I think. All right, fellas, I think this is another good one, and uh, we'll see you next time. The behavior panel. What would you guys say if he asked you, do you think I did it? What would be your response? I'm curious. You know I got my note here says, I'll do all the question around here, Bubba Louie. <laughs> 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 I'd say I'm not sure yet. That's that's the that's the one. This, you think I did this? Oh, I'm not sure yet. That's why I'm, that's what I'm here to find out. We're going to find out what happened. Yeah, you know? no, that, I, I would do exactly what this guy did. Look, if you cross that line in this investigation, you don't get the chance again. And in my opinion, when you do that, you have to do what he did. He said, "I'll let the facts speak. I'm just here to collect information." That way, you're not turning into the bad guy and you're not adversarial. Because there may be another opportunity, and you can't do it if you, the determinations in interrogation are about maintaining the relationship, and you have yeah. to be really careful. That's what I would do. I think I'd, I'd say I'd you create know, the, the. Go ahead, Chase. I think I'd say you know, Rob, uh, I'm I'm not here to to make that determination, but I've been doing this a long time, and it certainly doesn't. You don't seem like the person to do this kind of premeditated thing. And if if that is the case, or if something did happen, I definitely don't think you meant to do that. What if he said, why are you call me Rob? I'm kidding. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Isn't his name Rob? Didn't he go no. by Rob? Alec. Alex. I say Rob. No, Alec is what he calls himself. Alec. Oh, Alec? 
Isn't there an X on the end of his name? Yeah, but they yeah, say that Alec. That's right. Doesn't matter. Oh my God. He his called himself Murdoch. We heard him call himself Murdoch once, and then he goes to Murdoch. Then I hear him say Murdoch. Yeah. Hell. It's a Scottish name. Pronunciation can go all over the place. Mark's calling him Murdo. <laughs> At the top, murder, <laughs> murderer. There's a there's a, a joke. Me and my uh, buddy Jason Rosalie talked about. He was the he was uh, head of the hom- of homicide over at West Precinct in Nashville. And when I first moved to Nashville, I was walking by this mini mart. Me and a buddy of mine, and there was a lot going on. There was there was a uh, uh, they'd had it roped off, and the cops were they were walking by, and and there was a news guy there, right. And as we're walking by, I go, I go, hey man, what's going on? He goes, there's been a murder, like that. Like there's been a murder, and that's been sort of our. We've gone that's back funny. and forth for years. Every time I see him, he goes, what's going on? I always go, there's been a murder. And he was so when, when we were doing the, yeah, sorry, no, that's it. When we were doing the Doctor Phil thing, I realized how dark our sense of humor is because the juror was in our room and we were watching videos, and I was like, "Hey, man, sorry, our sense of humor is a little dark." <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. So here's what I'd do, Chase. I'd uh, to that question. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd throw my friend under the bus. I'd go. I'd go. <laughs> he, he, thinks, <laughs> he thinks you definitely do. Yes, which is a, <laughs> that's a great way to do it. That's a yeah, great way yeah. to do it. But he's like. And I can't convince him otherwise. He's definitely yeah. like he Good wants cop, he, bad cop. he wants you hung. Yeah, and that's he can, DOD he can do it himself straight away. Department of Defense uh, top interrogator qualities number seven: uh, interrogator distances themselves from authority figures. Yeah, that's yeah, threat and rescue. Is the yeah. So sorry for I felt so sorry for that little guy, uh, Greg. <laughs> Man, we went. We went in there, and he was in makeup, yeah. and he was he was welled up. He's about to cry. We were like, "What's wrong with this cat, man?" And then uh, Tina, was she's, the she's my makeup person. Yeah. She said he's really, really nervous. And tell what, tell what he said, Greg. When you said, "What's going on, man?" Yeah, he said, "Is he going to grill me?" And I was like, "No, man. You're like, <laughs> you're like the star of the show today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're an he's innocent so member he's, of the public." All right, check it out. So we're in Doctor Phil's dressing room. Let's get it. Okay, this, this place is something. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Let's go in here. We'll see that. Look at the rest of the room. Make sure we did it all. Oh, that's a gratitude sign. Come here. Yeah. Okay. Stay nice there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> You're selling it, Craig. Yeah. Look around. Look That's at this place. The, Real nice place. Oh, wait, now let's take a look at his cars. Look at that. You can see oh, that's, that's his car. And that's that's Robin's car. car. That's Robin's car and his car. Same thing out this window here. Yeah. Come around this way. Yeah. Come back this way. You can see his. Look at the uh, office. There's right. that. Here's the office. Yeah, it's a great, see. great office. Yeah. yeah. God. So he loves it in here. Hey, call security, will you? I got some riffraff in the office. What do you got?